Hey guys, and welcome back to Firestarters, the channel dedicated to telling you tales of the greatest heroes who ever lived, the Saints. And welcome to part two of the amazing story of Fatima. So I think we'll just get right into it. Let's get into today's video. All right, so real quick, we're going to recap what happened in part one. So it is the 13th of May, 1917, and the three children, Lucia, Francisco, and Jacinta, are out tending their family's sheep on the Cabezo, the hill, where they saw the heavenly angel a year before. And while they're up on the Cabezo tending their sheep, they see the flash of lightning, and they start to hurry the sheep down the slope to head to the road to go back home, anticipating the incoming storm. And so, but then they see another flash of lightning halfway down and they continue taking a couple more steps. And this is the incredible moment when they see standing on a small home oak tree, a brilliant shining woman, brighter than the sun. And this is the moment when the children stopped amazed. And just to reiterate, Lucia described specifically in her memoirs that they were so close to this apparition, so close to this beautiful, shining woman brighter than the sun, that they were bathed in the light that was radiating from her. This beautiful, radiant woman then began to speak to the children, saying, Do not be afraid. I will do you no harm. Lucia asked the woman, Where are you from? She replied, I am from heaven. Lucia asked, what do you want from me? The woman replied, I have come to ask you to come here for six months in succession, on the thirteenth day, at this same hour. Later on, I will tell you who I am and what I want. Afterwards, I will return here yet a seventh time. Lucia asked, Shall I go to heaven? She replied, Yes, you will. And then she asked about Jacinta. Will Jacinta go to heaven? And then she replied, yes, she will go also. And then she asked about Francisco, will he go to heaven? And the lady replied, he will go there too, but he must say many rosaries. Lucia then asked about two of her friends who had died recently. Is Maria das Neves in heaven? And she replied, yes, she is. And what about Amelia? And the lady replied, she will be in purgatory until the end of the world. Oh boy. Oh boy. Anywho, the radiant woman then asked Lucia, are you willing to offer yourselves to God and bear all the sufferings he wills to send you as an act of reparation for the sins by which he is offended and of supplication for the conversion of sinners? Lucia replied, yes, we are willing. The heavenly woman replied, then you are going to have much to suffer but the grace of God will be your comfort. And as she said these words, she opened her hands from which an intense light shone. Lucia describes the light penetrating their hearts and innermost depths of their souls, making them see themselves in God. She said that the reflection showed their true identity in God more clearly than the best of mirrors. Moved by this supernatural occurrence, the children fell on their knees repeating, O oh, most holy trinity, I adore you, my God, my God, I love you in the most blessed sacrament. The woman spoke again, saying, Pray the rosary every day in order to obtain peace for the world and the end of the war. She then rose up into the sky towards the east until she disappeared in the immensity of space. Lucia described the light surrounding her opened up a path before her into the sky. The children felt as if they saw heaven opening. All right, so I just wanna pause here for a second. So Lucia and her two younger cousins, Francisco and Jacinta, encounter this beautiful, radiant woman from heaven. And the first thing Lucia asks this woman after she finds out that she's from heaven is, well, will I go to heaven? To which the lady replies, yes, you will. And so Lucia breathes a sigh of relief and she goes, okay, good. All right, what about my friends? I just think it's funny because that's what any of us would ask if we were to encounter a heavenly being is, well, 
would I go to heaven? And then, like, will my sister, my brother, my mom, my dad, will all these people go to heaven, all these people I care about? This apparition had a transformative impact on the three children, especially Jacinta. Now, the three children had made an agreement not to tell anyone about certain aspects of this apparition because, as you know from part one, all of the trouble they were getting into from talking about the apparitions of the angel and the accusations from Lucia's mother of lying. And so the children agreed to stay quiet about the whole situation in order to avoid any more unwanted negative attention or family quarreling. However, Jacinta kept breaking out into these enthusiastic exclamations like, oh, what a beautiful lady! Lucia kept getting angry with her, saying, look, if you keep talking about this, people are going to find out and we're going to get in trouble again. And Jacinta responds, no, don't worry, I won't talk about it. It's okay. And lo and behold, the next day, Francisco comes running down to Lucia, saying, Jacinta told everybody about the whole thing. Jacinta, with tears in her eyes, responds, I'm so sorry, there was just something within me that couldn't keep quiet. And of course, word spread throughout the families and throughout the whole village that the children had witnessed this apparition of this beautiful lady. Lucia's mother continued to get frustrated and worried about Lucia. Lucia details that she spared neither caresses nor threats nor even the broomstick to get her to confess that she was lying about the whole thing. The lives of the children were flipped completely upside down as they became the center of attention for this little village of Fatima. And as I mentioned earlier, the apparition of the lady was a transformative experience for the children, especially for Jacinta. And the three children began making austere sacrifices for the conversion of sinners. For example, they would refuse to drink water during the day. Like this is May going into June, so it's starting to get hot. And these kids are refusing to drink water. They're giving their lunch away to the sheep. They're, they're giving their water and refusing to drink when it's blazing hot out. And you think this is insane for children to have this level of commitment. Now, before I continue, I need to make a little note that the area of the apparition of the lady, even before the apparition, was called the Cova de Iria, in Portuguese meaning cova, cavern, or hollow. And Iria being a Portuguese name, meaning woman of peace. So hollow of the woman of peace. Now, as I mentioned earlier, on May 13th in that first apparition of the lady, she told the children to return to that same location on the Cova de Iria on the 13th day of each month for six consecutive months. And June 13th was rapidly approaching. And June 13th happened to be a festive day for all of Portugal as it was the feast of St. Anthony, who is one of the great Portuguese saints. Lucia talks about how much she loved this day because it was a festive day. There was always something called a festa or a great party, and she loved going to these parties. And Lucia's mother and her sisters began kind of taunting her, saying things like, we've yet to see you leave the festa just to go to the Cova de Iria to talk to that lady. When the 13th of June arrived, Lucia woke up, released her flock, intending to put them back in the pen by 9, go to Mass at 10, and then make her way to the Cova de Iria. But her brother had told her, don't go, go back home, because there's a bunch of people at the Cova de Iria waiting to talk to you about this whole thing that you started. Lucia found out that these people had traveled from all across villages surrounding Fatima just to talk to the three children. She told the people that it was still too early for the apparition to take place, and so she told the people, come to the 8 o'clock Mass with me first. After they finished Mass, Lucia returned home, and then around 11 o'clock, she went to her uncle's house where Jacinta and Francisco were waiting for her, and from there, they set out for the Cova de Iria. Now, I think it's really great that Lucia invited these people to come to Mass with her, because it's a great testament to how we're always longing for the amazing and the supernatural. Here, Lucia is just saying, it's like, you want the supernatural? You've got it available to you every single day in the Holy Mass. Pretty amazing wisdom for a 10-year-old. On the way to the Cova de Iria, there were many people surrounding the children, following them, asking them a thousand questions, and Lucia talks about how distressing it was for her and her family. And she talks about how her mother did not tolerate lying. Like, if there was anything she hated, it was lying, especially for her own children to lie. 
and here she is thinking that Lucia is deceiving all of these people. She tells Lucia, make up your mind what you want. Either undo all this deception by telling these people that you've lied, or I'll lock you up in a dark room where you won't even see the light of the sun. After all the troubles I've been through, and now a thing like this to happen. And Lucia talks about how her sisters sided with her mother, and all around her was the atmosphere of scorn and contempt. Lucia talks about how she would often think about the older days of her childhood, and she would ask herself, where is all that affection now that my family had for me just a short while ago? Jacinta would see Lucia in tears and she would attempt to console her, saying, Don't cry. Surely these are the sacrifices which the angel said that God was going to send us. That's why you are suffering, so that you can make reparation to him and convert sinners. After the children arrived at the Cova de Iria, they got down on their knees and they began praying the rosary with a number of people who were present. After they finished praying the rosary, they saw the same flash of light beautiful, radiant woman appeared again on the holm oak tree, just as she did back in May. Lucia asked the woman, What do you want of me? The woman responded, I wish you to come here on the 13th of next month to pray the rosary every day and to learn to read. Later, I will tell you what I want. Lucia then asked the woman that a sick person she knew be cured. She responded, If he is converted, he will be cured during the year. Lucia then said, I would like to ask you to take us to heaven. The woman responded, Yes, I will take Jacinta and Francisco soon, but you are to stay here for some time longer. Jesus wishes to make use of you to make me known and loved. He wants to establish in the world devotion to my immaculate heart. Distraught, Lucia asked, Am I to stay here alone? She responded, No, my daughter. Are you suffering a great deal? Don't lose heart. I will never forsake you. My immaculate heart will be your refuge in the way that will lead you to God. As the lady spoke these words, she opened her hands as she did a month prior, and the same intense rays of light shone from her hands on the children. Lucia described it as being immersed in God. And as she was looking at this light, she noticed that Jacinta and Francisco seemed to be part of a light rising up toward heaven, while she was immersed in a light being poured upon the earth. In front of the palm of the woman's hand was a heart encircled by thorns which pierced it. The children understood this to be the Immaculate Heart of Mary, outraged by the sins of humanity and seeking reparation. Now that's a very important detail because Lucia talks about in her memoirs that that was a secret the lady revealed to them at that time. She did not tell the children to keep that a secret, but they felt compelled to do so by God. We'll get more on that later. The lady then rose up and disappeared into the heavenly opening in the sky, just as she did back in May. Now after this June 13th apparition, their parish priest came to know what was happening and sent word to Lucia's mother to take her to his house to be questioned. Lucia's mother was greatly relieved at this, thinking that the priest was going to take responsibility for all of these events on himself. She told Lucia, tomorrow we're going to mass the first thing in the morning. Then you are going to the Reverend Father's house. Just let him compel you to tell the truth, no matter how he does it. Let him punish you. Let him do whatever he likes with you, just so long as he forces you to admit that you have lied, and then I'll be satisfied. Lucia's sisters also sided with their mother, issuing endless threats and frightening her about this interview she was about to undertake with the parish priest. The Reverend Father also requested Manuel and Olympia Marto, the parents of Francisco and Jacinta, to send them to the interview as well. And this was actually one of the only consolations for Lucia at this time because they were comforting Lucia saying, never mind if they beat us, we'll suffer for the love of our Lord and for sinners. The next day, Lucia went to mass with her mother and she offered her sufferings to God. And after mass, they made their way to the parish priest's house. And when they got there, they knocked on the door and the parish priest's sister answered the door, told them to take a seat. And then a couple minutes later, the parish priest appears. He motioned Lucia's mother to have a seat, and then he beckoned Lucia to come forward to his desk. And much to Lucia's surprise, the priest was calm and kind, 
in his questionings. However, Lucia was still frightened at the uncertainty of what was to come. The priest concluded his interview saying, It doesn't seem to me like a revelation from heaven. It is usual in such cases for our Lord to tell the souls to whom he makes such communications to give their confessor or parish priest an account of what has happened. But this child, on the contrary, keeps it to herself as far as she can. This may also be a deceit of the devil. We shall see. The future will show us what we are to think about it all. After this interview, Lucia, already in great distress, became much more distressed, now thinking that she was under the influence of the devil. Jacinta replied, no, not at all. They say the devil is very ugly and under the ground in hell, but that lady is so beautiful and we literally saw her ascend into heaven. But still, Lucia was so discouraged that she even contemplated admitting to actually lying just to end the whole situation. And replying again, Jacinta said, no, please don't do that because then you'll actually be lying and lying is a sin. And throughout the next month leading up to the 13th of July, which would be the next apparition, she experienced these intense nightmares at night about the devil laughing at her and trying to drag her down into hell. And she would wake up in the middle of the night screaming and wake up her whole family. And her darkness of spirit became so intense that she made a resolve not to return to the Cova de Iria anymore. Lucia told this to Francisco and Jacinta, they became extremely distraught and Jacinta said, no, you have to go. The lady told us that we have to go. And Lucia replied, no, I'm not going. Listen, if the lady asks for me, tell her I'm not going because I'm afraid it may be the devil. The following day on the 13th of July, impelled by a strange force, Lucia felt that she had to return to the Cova de Iria. So she ran over to Jacinta and Francisco's house and found them kneeling down crying in front of their bed. And she asked them, aren't you going then? And they said, no, not without you. And she said, yes, I'm going. And so their faces lit up with joy and they made their way to the Cova de Iria. The children gathered to that same spot where the lady had been appearing on the home oak tree. And they found a large group of people all praying the rosary. And when they finished praying the rosary, they saw the same flash of lightning again that they had been seeing, and the lady appeared once again on the home oak tree. What do you want of me? Lucia asked the woman, and she responded, I want you to come here on the 13th of next month and to continue to pray the rosary every day in honor of Our Lady of the Rosary in order to obtain peace for the world and the end of the war, because only she can help you. Oh, and by the way, if you haven't figured this out already, this is the year 1917, so World War I is still raging. And so this is Our Lady talking about praying the rosary will end this war. Lucia replied, I would like to ask you to tell us who you are and to work a miracle so that everybody will believe that you are appearing to us. And the lady responded, continue to come here every month. In October, I will tell you who I am and what I want, and I will perform a miracle for all to see and believe. Lucia mentioned that the lady emphasized how necessary it was for people to pray the rosary in order to obtain the graces that she spoke of earlier. She continued, sacrifice yourself for sinners and say many times, especially whenever you make some sacrifice, oh Jesus, this is for love of you, for the conversion of sinners and in reparation for the sins committed against the immaculate heart of Mary. After the lady spoke these words, what happens next is absolutely wild, perplexing, hard to understand, abstract, and the children kept it secret until when Lucia revealed it in 1941 to her memoirs to Jose Alves Correa da Silva. And it is called The Secret of Fatima. And there are three parts. I'm gonna do my best to explain them to you. So here we go. I'm using direct quotes from Sister Lucia's memoirs here. So. As the lady spoke these words, she opened her hands again, as she had done in the previous months. This time, the light from her hands penetrated the earth and illuminated what Lucia described as a sea of fire. Inside the sea of fire, the children saw demons and souls in human form, like transparent burning embers, all blackened or burnished bronze, floating about in the conflagration, now raised into the air by the flames that issued from within themselves together with 
great clouds of smoke now falling back on every side like sparks and huge fires without weight or equilibrium amid shrieks and groans of pain and despair. This scene horrified the children. Lucia mentioned that the people who were there with the children heard Lucia cry aloud in fear. She likened the demons to frightful and unknown animals, black and transparent like burning coals. All right, so that is the first part of the Secret of Fatima, and it's known as the Vision of Hell. All right, so the second part of the Secret of Fatima goes like this. As the terrifying image ceased, the lady looked down to the children and said, you have seen hell where poor sinners go. In order to save them, God wishes to establish in the world devotion to my immaculate heart. If you do what I tell you, many souls will be saved and there will be peace. The war is going to end. But if people do not cease offending God, a worse one will break out during the pontificate of Pius XI. When you see a knight illuminated by an unknown light, know that this is the great sign given to you by God that he is about to punish the world for its crimes by means of war, famine, and persecutions of the church and of the Holy Fathers. To prevent this, I shall come to ask for the consecration of Russia to my Immaculate Heart and the communion of reparation on the first Saturdays. If my requests are fulfilled, Russia will be converted and there will be peace. If not, she will spread her errors throughout the world, causing wars and persecutions of the church. The good will be martyred, the Holy Father will have much to suffer, and various nations will be annihilated. But in the end, my Immaculate Heart will triumph. The Holy Father will consecrate Russia to me, and she will be converted. And a period of peace will be granted to the world. She also told Lucia that the dogma of the faith will always be preserved. All right, so if you're confused, it's okay because I'm going to break a lot of this down and explain more of it in detail. So just for some perspective, World War I is raging. It's the year 1917, and this is an absolutely atrocious war, worse than any war in the history of the world. So eight million soldiers died in this war, and then later some 13 million civilians. And the lady is saying, if people don't cease offending God, that an even worse war will break out under the pontificate of Pius XI. So basically predicting World War II, which would happen a couple decades later. The lady also mentions something curious when she says, when you see a knight illuminated by an unknown light, know that this is a great sign given to you by God that he is about to punish the world for its crimes. Now on January 25th through 26th of the year 1938, a massive geomagnetic storm impacted the earth. This aurora borealis was so massive it could be seen over the whole of Europe and as far south as southern Australia, Sicily, Portugal, and across the Atlantic to Bermuda and southern California. This is an aurora borealis, so it happens in the northern hemisphere and it could be seen as far south as Australia. You can read about this incredible event in hundreds of news stories from all around the world that were published around this time and you can, you can type it into Google right now and read about it, it's amazing. Less than two years after that Aurora Borealis, the Nazis would invade Poland and World War II would begin. Now, if that wasn't crazy enough, the lady also mentions the consecration of Russia to her Immaculate Heart, as well as the communion of reparation on the first Saturdays. Now, I am going to mention a lot more about these two things in the third video, but until then, let's move on. So basically, the woman gives the children a vision of the depths of hell, where poor sinners are being brutally tortured and persecuted for all of eternity. And the children witness all these horrifying images and hear shrieks and groans of pain. And they're so terrified, they scream out. And other people that are at the Cova de Iria can hear the children screaming. They can't see the vision that the children are seeing, but they can hear them screaming in terror. And the lady says, okay, you have seen hell where the souls of poor sinners go in order to save them from this terrible fate. God wishes to establish in the world devotion to my immaculate heart. And if this happens, many souls will be saved, there will be peace, and the war will end. After the lady showed the children the vision of hell and then talked to them about the importance of the devotion to her immaculate heart, the importance of the consecration of Russia and the communion of first Saturdays, the lady then showed the children 
a third vision. And this vision is called the third part of the secret of Fatima. And Sister Lucia did not reveal it until her memoirs in 1944. And it was actually kept secret by the Vatican until the year 2000 when it was revealed publicly. It's just crazy, it was revealed 23 years ago. And it goes like this. After the lady spoke these words to the children, they saw an angel above and to the left of the lady, holding a flaming sword in his left hand that flashed with fire that Lucia described, would set the world on fire, but they died out in contact with the splendor that Our Lady radiated towards him from her right hand. The angel pointed towards the earth with his right hand, crying out, penitentia, 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 which means penance, penance, penance. Lucia vividly describes, and we saw in an immense light that is God, something similar to how people appear in a mirror when they pass in front of it, a bishop dressed in white, we had the impression was the Holy Father or the Pope. Other bishops, priests, and religious men were going up a steep mountain, at the top of which there was a big cross of rough-hewn trunks as of a cork tree with the bark. Before reaching there, the Holy Father passed through a big city, half in ruins and half trembling with halting step. So he's limping basically up this mountain. Afflicted with pain and sorrow, he prayed for the souls of the corpses he met on the way. Having reached the top of the mountain, on his knees at the foot of the big cross, he was killed by a group of soldiers who fired bullets and arrows at him. And in the same way, there died one after the other bishops, priests, religious men and women, and various lay people of different ranks and positions. Beneath the two arms of the cross, there were two angels, each with a crystal aspersorium in his hand, in which they gathered up the blood of the martyrs and with it sprinkled the souls that were making their way to God. All right, so if you're like me, it's really hard to picture this scene in your head because there's a ton of stuff going on. So here's an illustration to help you out. So as you can see, we got the angel, right? shouting penitentia, penitentia, penitentia. We've got Our Lady right here with her heart putting out the flames. And here is this mountain, right? And here is the Holy Father dressed in white. You can see he's got blood on his back from where he was shot. You got all these people, you have soldiers, and you've got the martyrs, right, hovering over the cross. And these are the angels with the crystal aspersoriums gathering the blood of the martyrs. Now, another quick note about this vision. In a private interview with a man named Cardinal Bertone, Lucia told him that Our Lady held her heart in her right hand and a rosary in her left hand. And Lucia later realized that it was Our Lady's heart that put out the fire of the angel's sword. Also, here's another note before we continue. So Lucia is the only one of the three children who's able to speak to the lady. Jacinta can hear and see the lady, but is not able to speak to the lady. And Francisco can see everything that's going on, but he cannot hear the words being spoken. After she showed the children these visions, she told Lucia, do not tell this to anybody. And Lucia asked, well, can I tell Francisco? Because remember, Francisco can't hear what's going on. And she said, yes, you may tell Francisco. And then she said, when you pray the rosary, say after each mystery, Oh my Jesus, forgive us, save us from the fires of hell, lead all souls to heaven, especially those in most need. After this, there was a moment of silence and Lucia asked, is there anything more you want of me? The lady replied, no, I do not want anything more of you today. Then the lady ascended towards the east and disappeared as she did in the months prior. Now, like I said, we're going to talk more about the secret of Fatima, the visions given to the children by Our Lady on the July 13th apparition. We're specifically going to talk a lot more about the vision of the Pope on the mountain with the refune cross and the angels with the crystal aspersoriums, and we're going to talk a lot more about it in video number three, so stay tuned. After this July 13th apparition, life for the three children would continue to grow worse, especially for Lucia, as her mother continued to doubt her, accusing her of lying and causing chaos, and she had her sent back to the parish priest for more questioning, and the authorities notified the families of the children that they all needed to appear before the administration at Villanova de Aurem. Manuel Marto, the father of Francisco and Jacinta, agreed that he would appear before the administration, but that he would not bring his children and subject them to court. Lucia's parents, however, felt completely the opposite. 
and they brought Lucia to the administrator on the following day on the 11th of August. And Lucia mentioned that what hurt her the most about this whole situation was the indifference shown to her by her parents. On the 11th of August, Lucia and her parents rode on the back of a donkey all the way to Villanova de Aurem to the administrator's office. And on the way, Lucia actually fell off the donkey like three times. It's just like, when is this girl gonna get a break, man? During the interrogation, the administrator told Lucia that she needed to reveal absolutely everything that the lady was saying, including the secrets that were just revealed to the children a month prior. And when she refused, he started resorting to promises or even threats that he could use his authority to actually imprison the children, possibly even execute the children, and told her that she's never to return to the Covidi area ever again. After the interrogation ended, Lucia and her family rode back home, and this is the 11th of August, so it's two days before August 13th, which would be the next apparition, and people are pouring in like never before into Fatima, and trouble in Lucia's family grew to unprecedented levels, and as more people drew to the Covid area, all the family's crops were being trampled on and eaten by animals, and all the blame was put on Lucia. What's truly remarkable is Lucia in her memoirs says this, by a special grace from our Lord, I never experienced the slightest thought or feeling of resentment regarding my mother's manner of acting toward me. As the angel had announced that God would send me sufferings, I always saw the hand of God in it all. As August 13th dawned, crowds were pouring in from everywhere, and Lucia describes feeling like a ball being tossed around in the middle of all these people. And in the middle of the commotion, an order from the administrator came down in which Lucia had to go immediately to her aunt's house. And her father, who got the notification, retrieved Lucia from the crowd of people and brought her to her aunt's house where the administrator was there with Francisco and Jacinta. The administrator vigorously interrogated the children and commanded the children to reveal everything that the lady had told them, including the secrets. And when they refused, he threatened them and said, you are not to return to the Covid area. And when they refused still, he told Lucia's father and uncle to take the children to the parish priest's house. And when they got there, they were taken by police and they were sent to be imprisoned at Villanova de Aurem. Now, when the children were put in prison at Aurem, they were initially placed in separate cells, and Jacinta would suffer greatly in this time, feeling like they had been completely abandoned by their parents. She would tell Lucia, neither your parents nor mine have come to see us. They don't bother with us anymore. And her brother would respond, don't cry. We can offer this to Jesus for sinners. Then raising his eyes and his hands to heaven, he made the offering. Oh my Jesus, this is for love of you and the conversion of sinners. And Jacinta added, with tears in her eyes, and also for the Holy Father and in reparation for the sins committed against the Immaculate Heart of Mary. The children were eventually brought to be in the same cell so that they could be together. And the guards would tell the children that they're about to be fried alive. I would like to add just real quick, if you're ever having a bad day, just think of these three children in prison. And they're just like, it's for love of Jesus. Now, one of the prisoners in a nearby cell would overhear the children crying in great distress, thinking that they were about to die and never see their friends and family again, would say to them, all you have to do is tell the administrator the secret. And Jacinta would reply, never, I'd rather die. The children then decided to kneel down and pray a rosary. And before they did, Jacinta took a religious medal from around her neck and gave it to the prisoner next door and asked him to hang it on the wall for them, which he did. And they knelt down and prayed their rosary and the prisoners prayed with them. Now, a couple of the prisoners were actually in the same room as the children in this prison. And one of the prisoners had a concertina with him, which in case you don't know, is a small accordion-like instrument and he began playing it, and the prisoners asked the children if they would like to dance. And the children, having grown up going to festas and singing and dancing, absolutely loved this. And one of the prisoners picked Jacinta up and just began dancing with her around the room. And it was almost like an act of God to console the children in their time of great distress. 
The children would spend two nights in the prison at Aurem until on the 13th of August, he would release the children from prison, thinking that, okay, prison time's not doing anything, death threats aren't doing anything to get the children to talk. And he also thought that he kind of won by preventing the children from going to the COVID area on the 13th of August, which was when the next vision was supposed to take place. However, something would happen on the 19th of August, the following Sunday. Lucia writes in her memoirs, I was accompanied by Francisco and his brother John. We were with the sheep in a place called Valinos when we felt something supernatural approaching and enveloping us. Suspecting that Our Lady was about to appear to us and feeling sorry lest Jacinta might miss seeing her, we asked her brother to go and call her. As he was unwilling to go, I offered him two small coins and off he ran. Meanwhile, Francisco and I saw the flash of light, which we called lightning. Jacinta arrived and a moment later, we saw Our Lady on a home oak tree. Lucia asked her usual question, what do you want of me? And the lady responded, I want you to continue going to the Cova de Iria on the 13th and to continue praying the rosary every day. In the last month, I will perform a miracle so that all may believe. And Lucia responded, what do you want done with the money that the people leave in the Cova de Iria? In case I didn't mention it, the people who've been visiting the Cova de Iria, the thousands of pilgrims have been leaving all this money as offerings. And the lady responded, have two litters made. One is to be carried by you and Jacinta <clears throat> and two other girls dressed in white. The other one is to be carried by Francisco and three other boys. The money from the litters is for the festa of Our Lady of the Rosary, and what is left over will help towards the construction of a chapel that is to be built here. And Lucia asked, I would like to ask you to cure some sick persons. She responded, yes, I will cure some of them during the year. Then, looking very sad, our Lady said, Pray, pray very much, and make sacrifices for sinners, for many souls go to hell, because there are none to sacrifice themselves and to pray for them. The Lady then began to ascend as usual towards the east and disappeared into the clouds. Notice how Our Lady doesn't ask Lucia, Hey, why weren't you at the COVID area on the 13th of August like we agreed upon? I don't know if you noticed, but today's the 19th, you're six days late. Instead, she just talks to Lucia like normal. She says, continue to pray the rosary every day, offer sacrifices for sinners, and return to me on the 13th of next month. It's like, yeah, I knew you were in prison, it's okay. Now, after this August apparition, the three children would look for ways that they could make sacrifices to God, ways to mortify themselves. They would tie ropes tightly around their waist. They would walk through stinging nettle plants and they would give their lunch away to poor children. Now, a lot of people will hear this and think, oh, that's really weird, children doing this to themselves. It seems like self-abuse. But you have to remember that the greatest saints in history wrote about mortification and they said that it is a necessary step toward holiness because it requires that you empty yourself of the pleasures of the world so that you can be filled with the Father in heaven. That I'm not gonna be ruled by the pleasures and the comforts of this world. I'm gonna be ruled by God my Father. And the children knew this. Lucia's mother also began to feel a little bit more at peace because she started thinking just maybe Lucia wasn't lying about this after all. She did still struggle with her doubts, and Lucia mentioned that she said, I used to think before that if there were just one other person who saw anything, then I'd believe. But now so many people say they've seen something, and I still don't believe. Lucia's father also began to come to her defense when people would accuse Lucia of lying or even witchcraft. As the 13th of September drew near, Difficulties for Lucia's family increased still. The COVID area was now a total loss for pasture of their flock, and Lucia's mother had to resort to selling their flock. Lucia, still being blamed for a lot of what was happening to their family, still spoke kindly of her mother. She said, on her part, my mother endured everything with heroic patience and resignation. And if she reprimanded me and punished me, it was because she really thought I was lying. She recalls her mother saying, could it be that all this is God's work and punishment for my sins? If so, then blessed be God. 
Lucia, Francisco, and Jacinta would also continue to receive death threats if they continued going to the COVID area, and their response was always the same. Well, then Our Lady will just take us to heaven, so we're okay. As the 13th of September arrived, the children set out for the COVID area, and on the way, they encountered a mass amount of people, more than ever before, all flocking to the COVID area to witness this September apparition. And as the people were flocking in, they were throwing themselves on their knees at the children, begging them, pleading with them to talk with Our Lady and cure my son who is blind or cure my daughter who is deaf or bring back my son who's gone off to war or cure my health, I have tuberculosis. You know, just all these people begging them to give their petitions to Our Lady. As the children were making their way through the crowds, they said yes to some of these petitions, and a gentleman would eventually help them clear a path so that they could make their way to the Covida area. The children finally arrived at the Covida area, and upon reaching the home oak tree, they began praying the rosary with the multitude of people who were present. And when they were finished, they saw the same flash of light, and Our Lady appeared once again on the home oak tree. Our Lady spoke, saying, continue to pray the rosary in order to obtain the end of the war. In October, our Lord will come, as well as Our Lady of Sorrows and Our Lady of Mount Carmel. Saint Joseph will appear with the child Jesus to bless the world. God is pleased with your sacrifices. He doesn't want you to sleep with the rope on, but only to wear it during the daytime. I just think that's a really funny detail, like God basically telling the children, hey, you guys are doing great, but you can, you can tone it down just a little bit. Lucia then asked, I was told to ask you many things, the cure of some sick people, deaf or mute people, people with tuberculosis. And Our Lady responded, yes, I will cure some, but not others. In October, I will perform a miracle so that all may believe. Then Our Lady began to rise as usual and disappeared into the clouds. Now, after this September apparition was a great time of anticipation, as the next apparition would take place in October, which was when Our Lady said that she would perform a miracle for all to see and believe. News of this spread not only all throughout the entire country of Portugal, but all around the world. News teams from around the world, including reporters from the United States with the New York Times, came journeying across the ocean to this little village in Portugal that nobody had heard of called Fatima. As October 13th drew near, rumor spread that the authorities intended to explode a bomb near the children at the moment of the apparition. And the children simply responded, how wonderful, if we were granted the grace of going up to heaven from there together with Our Lady. Lucia's parents, however, were very much afraid, and for the first time, her parents accompanied her and the children to the Covida area, and they said that if their daughter was going to die, they wanted to die by her side. On the 13th of October, they left home early, expecting delays from the gathering clouds, which was absolutely the case. Around 70,000 people gathered at the Covida area on October 13th, 1917. It was also raining, and so the ground was wet, the roads were really muddy, and still people were kneeling down in the mud, praying. And when the children arrived at the home oak, moved by an interior impulse, they told people to close their umbrellas and pray the rosary. A little while later, they saw the flash of light, and once again, the beautiful, radiant woman appeared on the home oak tree. And Lucia asked, What do you want of me? And she responded, I want to tell you that a chapel is to be built here in my honor. I am the Lady of the Rosary. Continue always to pray the rosary every day. The war is going to end, and the soldiers will soon return to their homes. And Lucia asked, I have many things to ask you, the cure of some sick persons, the conversion of sinners, and other things. And she responded, Some yes, but not others they must amend their lives and ask forgiveness for their sins. Then looking very sad, Our Lady said, do not offend the Lord our God anymore because he is already so much offended. Then opening her hands, she made them reflect on the sun. And as she ascended, the reflection of her own light continued to be projected on the sun itself. 
So just to give you a better mental picture of what's happening here, like I said earlier, it's cloudy and it's raining. So it's overcast, the sun is not shining. And as Our Lady shines the light from her hands, the clouds part and the light from her hands reflects onto the sun. Lucia says in her memoirs that she initially did not notice the sun appearing, but moved by an interior impulse, she screams out to the crowd, look at the sun. Now what happened next is spectacular and mind-blowing to say the least. And I'm gonna read from a website called the National Catholic Register, which is based on actual eyewitness accounts and newspaper articles from the event that day on October 13th, 1917. The clouds broke and the sun appeared in the sky. Unlike any other day, the sun began to revolve around the sky, an opaque spinning disk. It cast multicolored lights across the landscape, the people, and the surrounding clouds. Without warning, the sun began to careen across the sky, zigging and zagging toward the earth. Three times it approached, then receded. The panicked crowd erupted in screams, but there was no evading it. The end of the earth, some believed, was at hand. The event lasted 10 minutes, and then the sun, just as mysteriously, stopped then receded back toward its place in the heavens. After this sun dance, as it is famously called, the witnesses began to notice that their clothes, which minutes before were soaking wet from the rain which had been falling all day, were now completely dry. The ground too was as dry as on a hot summer day. Lucia also writes in her memoirs, after Our Lady had disappeared into the immense distance of the firmament, we beheld Saint Joseph, with the child Jesus and Our Lady robed in white with a blue mantle beside the sun. Saint Joseph and the child Jesus appeared to bless the world, for they traced the sign of the cross with their hands. When a little later this apparition disappeared, I saw Our Lord and Our Lady. It seemed to me that was Our Lady of Sorrows. Our Lord appeared to bless the world in the same manner as Saint Joseph had done. This apparition also vanished, and I saw Our Lady once more, this time resembling Our Lady of Mount Carmel. Now, an interesting thing to mention here is that Lucia in her memoirs does not mention anything about the sun dancing. She just mentions that she was driven by an interior impulse to direct people's attention to the sun. And in the meantime, she, Francisco, and Jacinta are all witnessing Saint Joseph with the child Jesus, with our Lord God, blessing the world with Our Lady of Sorrows and Our Lady of Mount Carmel, while all the other 70,000 people are seeing this insane sun dance. According to Father John DeMarchi, an Italian Catholic priest and researcher who spent seven years in Fatima, studied the phenomenon and interviewed witnesses. And he said, engineers that have studied the case reckoned that an incredible amount of energy would have been necessary to dry up those pools of water that had formed on the field in a few minutes as it was reported by witnesses. Among the 70,000 or so witnesses were reporters from the New York Times and from O Seculo, Portugal's most widely known newspaper. And here's a picture of the news article from O Seculo. You can see it's got a picture of the three children right here. And here's a better picture of the three children. You've got Lucia dos Santos on the left, Francisco Marto in the middle, and his little sister Jacinta on the right. I love this picture of Jacinta because she proves that you can be both adorable and kind of intimidating at the same time. You better be praying your rosary. So with that, we will finally conclude today's long video. We will conclude part two of this three-part series. Part three is going to cover more on the secrets of Fatima, and it's going to cover details about the lives of the children after the apparitions, especially Lucia's life as she grows older, becomes a Dorothean sister, and eventually a Carmelite nun. So stay tuned. Thank you guys for watching. Thank you for listening. Please like and subscribe. And as always, I'm praying for you, and please pray for me. Okay, bye.